following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. So this morning, God has a really powerful message for us. It's nothing I'm making up. It's right in the book of Ephesians. And we're going through this book of Ephesians, and there's been some pretty cool revelation. But I have to admit, there's a verse or two in this passage that can change your life if you will let it. There's a verse or two here that will let you see things in a different light. Have you ever seen one of these 3D movies, right? The 3D movies are out. Anybody? Come on. Right. It's a big thing. In fact, they're redoing movies. Even though these movies came out 10 years ago, they're doing them in 3D all over to make money a second time. And the difference this time is they give you the glasses, okay? They make money all over again. But the cool thing about 3D movies is if you're looking at them, they look kind of fuzzy and blurry. You don't get them, but you put on those glasses, boom, and stuff jumps right out at you. In fact, they got some really cool stuff at the, at the, um, the IMAX that you can watch like fish swimming at you. you they, they look like they're going to bite you coming out of the screen. And you could look at things of space with these 3D glasses. And you see dimensions that you never knew existed before. I would suggest the same is true with the Word of God. There are things in God's Word that have a way of unlocking things in our life. That have a way of taking away the blur and letting us see with clarity. And that was Paul's prayer. He was writing to the church of Ephesus And we've been going through this uh, amazing letter. And what he said in the last couple of weeks, he said, look, I know you guys love God. I heard about your love for God and love for other people. That's beautiful. But Paul goes, my prayer for you is that God would open the eyes of your heart. Even though you're believers and you love God, I pray that God will open the eyes of your heart so that you will know the hope of your calling. If you would see in a different dimension, Paul's saying, if you could see the hope of your calling, it's my number one prayer. He's like, I keep praying for you guys. If you would know the hope of your calling and the power that he has for you to walk out that calling, your life will be different. And the lives of those around you will be different. Again, you guys are believers. You love God. Beautiful. But if you could only see what I'm trying to pray that you will see, you will understand calling in a whole different way. And by the way, he's not writing to apostles, he's writing to all believers, he's writing to a church just like us, saying, believers, if you would just understand your calling in God's power, there's a whole other dimension of opportunity to see. And so that's where we're going to be picking this up in Ephesians chapter 1. I really want to focus on a couple of verses, uh, and we covered some of this last week, and I know I'm going over again what we covered, but there's a couple of verses that need to, we need to camp out on today. We're going to camp out with a couple of verses. These verses, I believe, are going to give you clarity, like those 3D glasses, where it all comes into focus. And it's really beautiful. It's powerful. Uh, to me, it's riveting. I mean, I, I've read this many times, and I, I, it never really jumped out at me. And this time, when I was going through it, I'm like, hello, <laughs> it's right there in Scripture. And I started looking through all kinds of commentary going, is anyone else seeing this? And some commentators kind of blow right over it just like I have before. And there's a couple other commentators going, are you seeing what I'm seeing? It's right in the word of God. Paul sees it this way. This was Paul's intention. And I believe, and and it's my prayer, that you get a whole nother level of disclosure from the kingdom of God on what it could be like in your life as far as design and fulfillment. Um, Picking it up in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 1. He's talking about the power available to believers. And he says, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. If you have your Bible, if you can underline verse 23, because it can change your life. We're going to unpack this here. He's talking about God's power available to us. He's saying the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father is available 
in the life of a believer. Many believers don't understand that. We spent some time in the last couple of weeks talking about the power of God specifically. But now he's talking about how this happens, how this, this whole thing unfolds, and it, and it really starts with God's order. If you read scripture, you realize that God is a God of order. You guys realize that? God's a God of order. All through the Bible, he had order for things, and he had, he, he's got certain ways he does things in God's economy. And, and, and in the order of God, the first thing we need to know is that regarding God's people, regarding the family, that Jesus is the head. He is the head of the church. He's head of all the people, all the time, and everything. Jesus has got to be first in everything we do. If Jesus isn't first, we are completely out of order in God's economy and what what God can bless in our lives. Jesus has got to be first. The passage is saying Jesus is above everything, every power, ruler, principality, now or in the future or the past. He's above it all. And specifically, he says that Jesus is the head of the church. Now, that's why the leaders here at Metro in the Valley, we, when, when we make decisions, we pray, Jesus, what will honor you the most? When we have to make decisions with things, uh, our leadership, we pray about, Jesus, what will you get the most glory out of? Um, a good question for yourselves. You might want to write it down if you're a note taker, but uh, if you're trying to make decisions, ask yourself, is this best for me or is it best for the bride? Is this best for me or is this best for the Lord? When you start asking questions that way, you're going to start seeing a little different clarity on, on the will of God in your life. That's what we try to do. And what's important about this is, Jesus is the head of the church, and you have a position in his family. You have a God-given position in God's family, not some random happenstance. You literally have a specific place, not just a general place, specific place. And today we want to unpack that a little bit. We want to unfold that reality. We're going to look at two different levels of the opportunity and the position that God's giving you. First, we're going to look at the general And then we're going to look at it more specific. And I hope this begins to speak to you the way it speaks to me. The first part of the general part is the church. The church, ecclesia is the Greek word, iglesia in Espanol, the family of God, the people that were called out. We are the family, the believers. And Jesus is the head of the church. He's in charge. We want his will to be done. We are his people. It's his power. That's the reality of the church. Anytime a church historically starts to, to plan on doing things for themselves, they completely get out from the will of God, realizing that it's his church. It's always his. It always has been. Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. It's his church, not ours. We always need to think that way, pray that way, and, and, and realize that, that reality. But a thing about the church that starts to bring it into a tangible level, the Bible says that we are his body. And this is where it takes a turn. This is where clarity and focus starts to come in. We are his body. And you might be thinking, no, Jesus had a body and he died and he rose from from the grave. That was his body and this one is mine. Well, on one level that's true, but on a spiritual present day level, there's a, a reality and a truth that we as the church are his body. And if you look at 1 Corinthians, you can read it later on, uh, we see that the part of this reality in 1 Corinthians 12, the body of Christ, it says, is a whole chapter dedicated to it, that the body is alive. The body of Jesus Christ is alive today. Now, if you start holding on to this reality, you're going to start seeing the next steps. If you're stuck on that statement, the body of Christ is alive today, I want to pray that God brings you through this because this is a scriptural reality. The body of Christ is alive today. And this passage unpacks it and unfolds it with absolute clarity that we are his body and that we're all living members of his body. And in 1 Corinthians 12, it explains, there's a whole chapter dedicated to the reality that we are members of his body. It also says that God selected where our arrangement is in his body. And it also suggests that we are alive if we stay connected to his body. And if we choose to dislocate and and, and kind of be separated from any kind of body, that there's no real life out there. 
Just like a human body, you can't cut a limb off and and move it away and expect it to live. It's got to be attached to the body. God's heart is that the church is his body, not just this church, every church that lifts up the name of Jesus, every church that believes in his word and, 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 and the power of the resurrected Jesus is his body. And the passage was saying in 1 Corinthians that God designs all the different parts and he literally arranges the different parts. So if this was a physical body, God might have you being his hand. Maybe God's design in your life is for you to represent Jesus as being his hands. For some of you, it might be his ears, his eyes. It might be the heartbeat, a sensitivity to things around you that you see that maybe things that break your heart but they're not breaking someone else's heart. And you're thinking, why isn't their heart broken over this? Because God let you feel that in a whole other way. Does that make sense? Your heart is breaking for something that they're not getting it. They're in the family, they're not getting it. But you know what they're doing? They're walking out some level of service that is like, wow, I, I, I can't quite do that. And to them, they're saying, this is how God arranged me. He wanted me to be his feet. He, Jesus wanted me to be his hands. And this is the beautiful display of the, the body of Christ, which is alive. God designs us and he arranges us. The question is, there's no question about your design. We're gonna unfold this in a minute. You have a God-given design, a God-given position. The question really is this morning, church, is will you let him arrange you? Will you let God arrange you in his body? Think about that. Because some are like, no, I'm good. I don't, I don't want to do anything. I, don't, I just want to you know, get a little encouragement and go home, get through my week and get a little more encouragement. I need some encouragement. That's good. That's like this level. But you want to start growing in the kingdom. You want to start being used by God. You want his spirit to move through you. You want to live the abundant life that he called you to do. Oh, there's another step here. And that step is one where you say, God, you arrange the parts. You design the parts. I'm open to your arrangement. How do you want to arrange me in this beautiful representation of your body? And so if you're a note taker this morning, one thing you might want to jot down, first point, is that God expects me to be a functioning member of his body. He expects us all to be a functioning member of his body. If you need to understand this more, again, go back to 1 Corinthians 12, read that later on. If you, if you struggle with that thought, that concept, the Bible says that we are all living members of his body, which is very much alive. Now, this passage we're looking at today in Ephesians, it makes this statement about the church. And again, it makes it, it it stated in such a way, I had to step back and read it a few times and say, maybe I'm reading this wrong. Because if this means what it says it means, that's a whole paradigm shift in an enormous way. That, That changes what we do and why we do it and how we do it. And and, and, and this is a radical paradigm shift for all of us. If this says what it seems to say, in verse 23, it says of the church, it says that the church is the present day fullness, fullness of Jesus' body. Would you say that with me? Fullness of Jesus' body. One more time. The fullness of Jesus' body. I read that and I'm like, no, no way. There's no way we can be the fullness. Oh, we can maybe be a little slice, but there's no way we can be the fullness. How can that be? And the passage, and it's the thesis throughout the Bible, there's there's a building theme here of Jesus said, listen, I have to go. I'm going to go back and be with my father. And the apostles are like, no, we can't do this without you. We need you. Jesus is like, you don't understand. I have to go, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send my spirit to you. He is the comforter, the paraclete. He's going to come alongside you. He's going to guide you and and counsel you and comfort you and empower you to do the things that I told you to do. And now you are going to go ye therefore throughout the earth and you're going to represent me in all these different ways. And the apostles at first are going, how can that be? We can never be the fullness of you, Jesus. Wait and watch and see, Jesus would tell them. And they wait in the upper room in Jerusalem And the Spirit of God comes upon them and empowers them to be the incarnation of what Jesus was talking about. And then they start going out, representing Jesus in a way that people were going, I think Jesus is alive. I saw something over there. It looked just like Jesus. 
And it was the people of Jesus walking in the power of Jesus to be the fullness of what he was doing. This says that the church is the fullness of Jesus' body. Literally, it's the fullness. If you want to read what it says, it says, the church is the fullness by which Christ fills all things. In other words, it's saying the vehicle that God chooses to use to minister to the world, to represent Jesus, and to do the things that Jesus did is through the church. He could have sent angels. He could have done it some other way. He could have done it in invisible ways. But he says, I plan to use my children. My children are my body. In my absence, while I'm seated at the right hand of my father, my family of believers, my, the church, the ecclesia, the body of Christ is going to be the fullness of everything I want to do. They are going to be the full display, if you will. Um, one translation says, God's word translation says this of this verse. The church is Christ's body and completes him as he fills everything in every way. See, it's hard for us in the natural to think that we complete Jesus in any way, isn't it? Doesn't it sound odd to you? That's why I skipped over this. I'm like, I don't get it. And I moved on for years. This time I'm like, is that what it means? Is there any way that we complete him? And the reality is, yes, we do. Because in his design, he created us, and we're going to see in a minute, to be empowered to represent him globally around the planet, everywhere you are, to represent Jesus. Jesus wants to pour out kingdom authority and power through me and you to represent him in his absence because we are um, the fullness of his body is what this says. One commentator put it this way. God means to fill the universe with the glory of his son by putting the church on display as the embodiment of his son. Literally, God's design in the heart of God, this is not a secondary thought or by the way, if you ever get around to it, this is a main event. God is saying, and Paul is writing to the Ephesians going, look, you guys believe in God, you guys are saved, you guys love God, you love others. Beautiful, 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 hallelujah. And Paul says, my number one prayer for you, not apostles, believers, my number one prayer is God will, oh, even though you believe, is that God will open your eyes, the eyes of your heart, and you'll understand your calling and the power available to you. And here is why I'm saying it, Paul's like, because you might not know it, but you are the fullness of him in his absence. You represent him, and you are to be the display of Jesus Christ himself. A lot of us won't own that. A lot of us will go, no, man, not me. That's just Jesus. And Paul's saying, no, I hope your eyes will be open so you step into it and you're being willing to say, okay, God, by that same power that raised Jesus from the dead in my life, here goes. I'm willing to start taking steps. What does that look like? And Jesus would tell us, this is where the journey begins. This is where it gets exciting. Jesus would say, if you're willing to represent me and be on display for me, this is where it gets really, really exciting. Um, let me ask you this question. In your mind, think about this yourself. You, you, you're very well aware of the statement, WWJD, right? You guys familiar with that one? What would Jesus do? Remember, it was, the, it was kind of like the coolest thing that came out in a long time, a little bracelet everyone was wearing. What would Jesus do? I just wish they were wearing that bracelet for the last 2,000 years. There never would have been an inquisition or any of these other wacky things in history if we just asked, what would Jesus do? But it, it, you know, it's been a recent you know, reality of people asking, what would Jesus do? Let me ask you personally, and think about this in your own heart. If Jesus were walking around today, where you live in your community with the things you see, what are some of the first things that you think Jesus would do? Think about this in your own heart. In your world, in your circles, in your, the job, your neighborhood, whatever, wherever you go or whatever you see, what would Jesus do? What is the first things bubbling up in you like, well, certainly he would do this, I believe. Think about what Jesus would do. Think about what Jesus, what you sense that he should do. Think about what Jesus could do. And the beauty is this. Here's the newsflash. Jesus is walking around today. Jesus is walking around today through you 
and through me and through us. And that is not some bizarre statement. That's a scriptural reality. And when we understand it and we're willing to walk in it and walk in his power, it's like literally putting the 3D glasses on going, hello, I didn't see it before. I didn't get it. I didn't know it was there. Just like the church of Ephesus who Paul goes, you love God and you are saved and you love others and it's beautiful, but my number one prayer is the eyes of your heart are open because if you would just see this, church of Ephesus, if you would just see the hope of your calling to know that you specifically have one and to know the power of God to fulfill it, oh, you would understand opportunities that abound. There are opportunities that abound, he's telling the church of Ephesus. And I'm praying you see it so you can step into it. And I believe God's telling us the same thing. I'm praying that you see it so you can step into it. Is this guy, making sense to you guys? This is a radical statement. This is a life changer if you ask me. Literally, the spirit of God empowering you and me to represent him. That Jesus, the body of Christ, can still be on display today through you and I. And I just wonder what that would look like. I wonder what it looked like. What kind of reports would be coming out of that? Somebody saying, I was down at Trader Joe's today and I saw Jesus. Huh? What do you mean you saw Jesus? No, I saw Jesus. This guy was trying to get out of the car. He was struggling. Somebody went over to him. This gal went over to him and helped him out of the car and then put hands on him and started praying for him in the parking lot. Really? It looked like Jesus to me. Wow, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, and, and these, these orphan kids in our city that don't have any parents who end up in gangs, I, I saw people going down to them, dads, because they're missing a, a, a father figure, these dads going down to them and teaching these kids the heart of God and teaching them leadership and they're changing a whole... I saw Jesus today. I saw Jesus today with those kids today. Really? So I, yeah, I saw... I, it was his body. It was a total representation of everything Jesus did. I saw people saying, let the little ones come unto me. I saw Jesus today down at the homeless shelter because he was loving on people and he said, whatever you do to these, you did unto me. I saw Jesus today. Think of what it would look like, church, in our city. Understanding that display of his body and people saying, I think I saw Jesus today. I don't know about you, but I want to see that more than anything. Saying, I think I saw Jesus today. I think I saw him today. Uh, Warren Wearsby says this, Remember that you have been saved so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in your body. You are saved for the very reason that Jesus' life may be manifested in your body. So if you're a note taker, here's a second point, and this is important. What could Jesus do through me? If you'd write that down. I want you to dream about that. Work through that later on, but write it down. What could he do through me? Now, through me, he's not going to go solve world peace around the other side of the globe. I don't think that's my calling or, you know, some of these other things. But what could he do through me? Hmm. Well, this is where it starts getting exciting. This is where you start discovering the gifts that he puts in you. And God ordained those gifts to be on display. Here's the thesis of the New Testament, guys. Whatever God put in you, he expects to come out of you. That's the God-given design. Whatever he put in you, he put it in there. He expects it to come out of you. And if there's things in you that are not coming out of you, God's like there's a disconnect there and there never will be the fullness of what life could be like because this is our design by nature. Think about that. Dream about that. What could Jesus do through you? Now, we talked about, um, we talked about the general overview. This is our position in the church that we're members of a living body, literally to be on display. And this next part talks more about specifics, specifically about your position. Where do you fit in this beautiful matrix of what God's doing? This, this beautiful big picture. Where, where are you and I in the mix with this, with this snapshot? Um, Ephesians 2.10. And last week we read this whole chapter, but we, we kind of had to leave these two verses out because there, there's so much power in them. We got to focus on them just exclusively today. This is where it gets a little more specific for you and for I. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The church, this is who we are, church. We're the body of Christ. We are his workmanship. I love this. The Greek word is poema, where we get our term poem from. 
We are God's poem. We are God's masterpiece. We are God's work of art. This is the, the Greek concept, the, the word picture, if you will. We are this beautiful work of art that God is doing. We are, the church, the body of Christ, the family of believers are this beautiful work of art that God is putting on display. This is what it's saying about it. This work of art. If you think in musical terms, we are the symphony. Boom, 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 boom. You know, you got some people coming in and they're waiting and they come in and they wait and then they come in and all of a sudden you're like, wow, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If you think in visual terms, look at that masterpiece that you appreciate and go, wow, look at that. Even the frame matters. All the colors matter and the strokes matter. And this is what it's saying. The church is God's poema. We are his masterpiece, his symphony. We are on display and it says why we were created. Do you know most civilizations go through life with a couple of key questions? Who am I really? Why am I really here? And where do I go when I die? Cultures and civilizations around the world have always asked that question. They've answered them in different ways. But the Bible is telling us really clear. We know who our creator is, God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And it says right here why we were created. We are God's work of art, poema, the church, and we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works means works of ministry. And this doesn't mean that you have to you know, sell your house or your, move out of your apartment and move to China to do missions work. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean God has available works of ministry right where you are right where you are, to be some sort of display. Whether it's coaching kids and sharing the heart of Jesus while you do it, whether it's getting down and talking to the little neighbor kid who doesn't have a father or is in a messed up situation and given life, whether it's being a teacher and sharing the heart of Jesus, but coming to terms specifically that God has good works for you and I to do. Literally good works, works of ministry. Um, And we have to understand that because there's many who go through life saying, I want more than anything in life to be happy. And I just think when people try to pursue quality of life, like their number one aim, I just want want to be happy and and, and I want to have a high quality of life. And, And I think they go through life oftentimes disappointed because God says, if you would seek me first, I'll give you all the desires of your heart. Those desires that don't get filled in all of our random pursuits. You look at Rockefeller who said, money's the aim. If I have money, I can do anything. And they said, Mr. Rockefeller, after he was already a multimillionaire, how much is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Why? Because pursuing what we think will bring us happiness ends up being void, void of life. And Jesus said, I know you better than you know yourself. I created you. I created you to do these displays for my glory. And if you seek me first, I'll give you the desires of your heart. There is contentment and joy in this that nothing else in life can bring. And that's because God's your maker and he knows what he put in you. He knows what he put in me. We were created, this is where it gets specific. We were created in Christ Jesus with gifts and talents and resources, all unique. Why? Because we're all a different part of this masterpiece. We're all different strokes and different colors in this big matrix, this masterpiece. In the symphony, some are the bass, some might be a cello, some might be a viola, some are whatever. You know what I mean? There's, there's a beautiful symphony going on and God is saying, I gave you an instrument, I gave you a voice, I gave you a talent, I gave you, I gave you a snapshot of the display, of what the display could look like. If you're willing to recognize it and put it on display for me, it will be really beautiful. These are all God-given opportunities. And the amazing thing, this says that they were prepared in advance for us to do. Now, what's radical about this? This is not some random freak of nature or happenstance where you wake up one day and go, hey, I wonder what I can do. It's beyond that. This goes back to your design before you were born. This is saying that in advance, before you took a breath, God had you in mind. God knew you before you were born. That's how Ephesians opened up the chapter um, earlier in the, in the chapter. That God knew you and I before we were born and he literally put designs in us before we took a breath. And this is saying that God created us in Christ Jesus to do good works in advance for us to do. And that's pretty radical because that tells me God was very intentional about the things that he put inside us. Very intentional. Already specific ministries in advance for us to do. And 
the ministries that we do when we think about this, what does it look like? Again, it might be very simple things, but these things are not for our own benefit. They're for the benefit of others. They're for representing Jesus to help other people know him or move a little bit down the road, a little bit more, to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his mouthpiece in all of the diverse giftings that we have to help other people. So the last two points are this, if you're a note taker. It's not about keeping my gift. It's about giving it away. That's the kingdom of God. Everything God gave you is to give, give away. I mean, in, in a sense of gifting. He's not telling you sell your house and go be a pauper. Although some might have a call to be a missionary, and that actually is part of a missionary's life. A missionary is to give up everything and go live in a third world, but that's a specific gift for certain people. Everyone's got different gifts. But it's not about keeping my gift, it's about giving it away. If God gave you a gift of teaching, if God gave you a gift of encouragement, if God gave you a gift of intercession and prayer, there's a reason for it. It's got to be on display. It's got to live on another level. It can't just stay on here. Oh, no. That's missing out on the design. It's got to come out. There's got to be fruition. It's got to come to life in a bigger way. Uh, The fourth point is when God gave me a gift, he gave me a ministry. When God gave you a gift, he gave you a ministry. And again, this isn't like, oh, no, do I got to quit my job? No, it doesn't mean any of that. In fact, your ministry is probably on your job a good portion of it, and some of it's outside your job, some of it's in your home, on your block, on your neighborhood. Very tangible stuff. Representing Jesus wherever you are. And, and we want to help you intentionally today. We want to help you discover your gifts and the things that God put in you so that we can help you bring them out. In fact, later on in Ephesians, just to skip ahead, Ephesians chapter four, it says what my job description is. It gives pastors a job description. And it says, this is why God created pastors. And it goes on in Ephesians chapter 4. God calls pastors and teachers, this is the reason, to prepare God's people for works of service, listen to this, so that the whole body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, listen to this, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Once again, to equip God's people for works of service so that we can be that body that is really the fullness of Christ. Because right now, I think globally, the church is walking around like a limping body. Body of Jesus, trying in some ways, staggering in other ways. Why? Because there's some people in the body that are not finding their place in God's symphony. They're, they're sitting out. They're not tuning up. They're not putting on strings. They're, not, they're just out. They're on the sidelines. They're out. And so the body is moving forward, but it's not moving forward the way it should and the way it could. The body of Christ is not on display in our city as it could be. Now, this is not a guilt or a shame or a condemnation. I want you to look at it the other way. I want you to dream. Please dream of what it would look like. What would it look like when people start saying, I saw Jesus at Trader Joe's today? I'm telling you. It was, I mean, it looked like Jesus to me. Oh, it was a girl, but she did everything that Jesus did, and it was radical. I mean, I saw at the park, you wouldn't believe it, I I saw Jesus again at the park today, really. Why? Because the body of Christ is waking up to recognize realities like this and stepping out in faith and being on display for him. It's absolutely beautiful when it happens. Spiritual gifts. Paul said this, don't be ignorant of them. Because if you ask some of your friends that are believers, tell me about your spiritual gifts, they're like, huh? Scooby-Doo, huh? What do you mean? Spirit, your spiritual gifts. What are your spiritual gifts? I, I don't know. Paul says to the church, don't be ignorant of your spiritual gifts. That means don't ignore them, discover them. In fact, Paul goes further than that in 1 Corinthians. He says, desire them. Don't ignore them, recognize them, and desire them. These are God-given gifts that a lot of believers ignore. Recognize them. You have natural gifts and a tal- talents that God gave you, and you have spiritual gifts and this, this gifts test will help you discover and understand some of these things. They have to be discovered. And that's the only way, when you and I discover these and start putting them into motion, that's the only way we begin to discover uh, the fullness of what God wants to do in our lives. If our gifts are not on display, we miss out on so much. Uh, in fact, this might be a good time. I'm just gonna um, wrap up in a prayer. The ushers are gonna give out these gifts tests. And what I wanna encourage you to do is search your heart and take these and, um, and I want to encourage you to, the last page is a summary page. I want to ask you to 
hand that in so that we can encourage you in your gift in whatever that area is, we can help you in your next step. This is a big step in your growing as a believer is to literally come to terms with what your gifts are and how do you take the next step. It doesn't mean you're off to the races and you're sprinting tomorrow, but we want to help you take your next steps in whatever God put in you. We want to prayerfully see them discovered and help you put them on display. No one's going to push you or force you. We want to encourage you and help you with some direction on how these can be on display. Well, mighty God, I just thank you for what you're doing in our lives. I thank you for the gifts and the talents and the resources you put in our lives. I pray today, Lord God, that these would be discovered. I pray today would be a day of discovery in the kingdom of God, that the spiritual gifts you put in us, we would come to an understanding and an ownership of what they are. And the next step, God, I pray that we would be intentional at at stepping out of our fear and being willing to step out in faith and start putting our gifts to work in Jesus' name. Um, As the worship team comes up and closes out, I want to remind you, in in the story of the talents, there were people who had talents, and they said, you know, I'm just going to bury mine. It should be okay. And Jesus came back and said, no. If you bury your talents, I'll take what talents you have, and I'll give them to somebody else who's faithful with them. There is a reward, the Bible says, for being faithful with our talents. When you and I don't step out in our gifts and talents, there is a part of the body of Christ that's simply not represented. It should be represented. You might be saying, when you go out in public, you might say, well, where is the mercy that's supposed to be in the church? And if that gift is not on display, mercy's missing. Where is the, where's the administration? Where's the structure and the order? Why is it missing? Well, maybe that's your gift and it's not on display because that's your part. Where is the intercession? Where is the encouragement? Where are the spiritual gifts? Where is the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom when somebody so desperately needs it? Well, somebody maybe isn't functioning in their gift and the body is not being the fullness of the body. I want you to imagine what it could be like. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.